Part two, Daniel's vision of the Antichrist. Chapter eight is extremely similar chapter to seven in terms of the structure and the theme. Even the number of the verses almost match. Wow. <laughs> the only difference is that the chapter seven emphasizes the victory of the son of the son of man, whereas chapter eight focuses more on the Antichrist. Looking at verses one and two, another vision came to Daniel two years after he had the previous one. On the King Belshazzar's reign, a pleasure-seeking mentality spread throughout the Babylonian Empire. We listened to the message of Lydia yesterday, how the king was corrupted and how he was punished by it. In total, Belshazzar reigned for 11 years. During this spiritually corrupt and depraved time, what did Daniel do? He deepened his prayer life and set his heart on the word of God. Just like all my brothers and sisters here in GLEF 23. Then God showed Daniel yet another vision. Look in your Bible. Uh, verse 3 and 4. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it. And none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. According to 20, the ram in this vision represents the kings of Mer um, Medea and Persia. The higher horn, which later grew forth, represents Persia. Under the Persian king Cyrus II, the great Persia became the dominant power in this alliance. And then the next verses five and six. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came forward, the two-horned ram, and I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it in great rage. While Daniel was still admiring the ram, his attention swift, swiftly changed to this goat. According to verse 21, this goat represents the Greek king, the Alexander the Great, who conquered the vast Persian empire in just four years. In verse 8, Daniel already foresaw the decline of this kingdom. When the goat's horn was became, became greatest, it broke. At the height of his power, Alexander the Great died at the age of 33. Then Daniel saw a little horn that grew out of one of the four horns, which in turn had a sprung from horn of the Alexander the Great. This started small, but grew very large to the south, to the south, east, towards the west, the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens. It set itself up to be the great as a commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people sacrificed oh, it, their sacrifices were gone. It prospered in everything it did, and then the truth was fallen to the ground. So Daniel longed to understand this mystery of the vision. So when he prayed, God showed him a vision through 
uh, angel Gabriel. And this was about the end times. This was about the Antichrist. At the time of the end, the Antichrist will try to wipe out the believers and keep the truth of God away from the people. The Antichrist comes at a time when the wicked are widespread, like now. He will destroy the strong and corrupt many of God's holy people by deceiving them. His goal is to put himself in the place of God and force God's people to stumble and worship him instead. Historically, this description of the Antichrist was King Antiochus the Fourth, the Ep Epiphanes. He was a Greek Hellenistic king who ruled the Seleucid uh, Empire, which came out of the four succeeding kingdoms after the death of Alexander the Great. He gave himself the title of God. Call me God. He himself determined, he was determined to abolish Judaism. In 168 BC, he invaded Jerusalem and killed many Jews, including the priests and in, um, even the high priest. He forbade the Sabbath worship. He took away the circumcision, even the Jewish festivals, which they kept as a matter of life and death. He had the scriptures burned and erected the statue of Zeus with his own face in the temple of Jerusalem. He decreed that against the law of Moses given by God, unclean animals such as pigs were sacrificed there. This time was a time of serious hardship and suffering for many devout Jews. Countless men, women, and children who did not want to be unfaithful to God's law died as martyrs. And 2,000 years later, we are still in the time, the time of the end, where many men, many antichrists deceive us and make us fall due to sin every day. The spirit of the relativism deceives so many Christians that we no longer accept God's word as the absolute truth. Many Christians stop living according to God's word long ago, let alone passing on the biblical teaching to our next generation. One pastor said, when the word of God becomes an optional to us, our next generation will find it unnecessary. Again, the word of God, when the word of God becomes optional for us, our next generation will find it unnecessary. The Antichrist uses whatever the young people are drawn into, whether it is money, whether it is sex, whether it is power, and makes it a vehicle out of it, for their sinful practices to be considered as normal or even cool. In the name of God's love and acceptance, he has already seduced many into tolerating the sins of genderism. The rainbow, once a God sign of mercy and forgiveness, became a symbol of sexual liberty. Not only so, he also seduced people in the name of living a happy life, satisfactory life, to enjoy themselves to the maximum degrees with sexual immoralities, pornographies, drugs, alcohols, doing everything, whatever the heart's desire, only to experience the bitter consequence of sins. Chapter 8, verse 24b says, He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. That's the Antichrist. 
Those who walk in the counsel of the Antichrist will look confident because they look to be the victors. But you know what? Look at verse 25b. It says, Yet he will be destroyed. He will be destroyed. Not by human power, but the power of sovereign God. As we learn from chapter 7, no matter how dominantly and how overwhelmingly the Antichrist rules and destroys the children of God, he himself will be destroyed forever. The Antichrist, the Antichrist will be broken. And this gives us such confidence of the real victory. We, by this, can fight a good fight, fight a good fight of faith to the end. Amen. In spite of all the seductions of the world, through the deceit of the sin, in spite of all the afflictions, we can be sure that it is not the Antichrist, but God, who is the sovereign ruler and true victor. Let us pray every day that God may give us his spiritual discernment and his alertness through his words. Let us pray that we can teach our children and our friends the living word of God, which is the only absolute truth. Let us repent of our sins before God every day and pray to be prepared for Jesus' final victory and to share his victory with us. The sovereign ruler of the world is God. Everything that stands against God will be destroyed by him. Therefore, let's have confidence in God's victory. Let's make a decision of faith to live for the sake of Christ. Amen. May God be with you and bless you in this time of the end. To be spiritual victors who possess the hope of God. To share the word of God to young and old people to the end. May God use you as spiritual leaders and main characters in this spiritual revival. Amen. Let's read key verse together. Okay, ready and go. Then the sovereignty, power, and the greatness of all the kingdom under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the rulers will worship and obey him. Amen.